not listening to me. Somebody shout, all right, dear. Do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. You heard me tell you I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you really loved me, you would have been glad because I am going to the Father for the Father is greater and mightier. Watch this. Then I am. Keep going. And now I have told you this before it occurs so that when it does take place, you may believe and have faith in and rely on me. And then watch what he says next. I will not talk with you much, much more. Because the prince of this world is coming. He says, I'm sorry, Judas. I won't be able to have these kind of conversations much longer because the prince of this world is coming. He's coming in. But keep watching when he comes in. Because like a flood, God's about to lift up a standard against him. He has no place in me. He has no power over me. Because I'm the standard. Because I live a certain way. Because I walk a certain way. When he comes in, he's rendered powerless. Because there's a standard in me that he can't penetrate. He's coming. I love Jesus. I said, I love Jesus. The enemy is coming. That's not the question. The question is will he find a standard in you when he shows up? He's coming. He's coming to your house. He's coming to my house. He's coming to our neighbor's house. And the only thing that will flood him out is the standard. And it starts with how we live. High five your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, I know Jesus lives right. But the question is, can you live right? We'll talk more about it next week. We'll talk more about it next week. Over the course of the next three weeks, we'll break down each one of these aspects of this standard so that we can demonstrate that not only did Jesus do it, but his expectation is that we will do it. And as we learn to do it, we're going to see the enemy have less and less power to, watch this, to agitate us, to cause us to lose our coup, to cause us to lose our standard. Second part of the standard. I don't want you to just live holy, but I want you to love passionately. Would you look over at your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, the enemy cannot stand passionate love. (laughs) Yeah, he cannot, he cannot stand it. I define love, a passionate love this way. Go ahead. It is, it is selfless, sacrificial, nets, nets, go nets, that's live holy nets, love. That's okay. We define it this way. It is selfless, sacrificial, selflessly sacrifice and serve those whom God puts in your life. Selflessly, selflessly sacrificing and serving those who God puts in your life. The enemy cannot handle that. See, see, God's God's standard is so much higher than the world because the world says, I love you based on what you do. Yeah. World said, the world's love is, you cross me, you get me. You want some? God's love is so much different from that. And that's why he came to bring a standard. He came to bring a selfless, sacrificial serving of others that no one had ever seen before to show us what the standard looked like. To show us what it looked like to overcome the one who's trying to beat us down. And so he says to us in John chapter 15, I believe it is, watch him. I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. Abide in my love. Do what in my love? Continue in his love with me. If you keep my commandments, there you go, he's talking about how you live again. If you continue to obey my instructions, you will abide in my love and live in on it just as I have obeyed my father's commandments and live on his love. I don't want you to miss this. Jesus said he lived on his father's love. When's the last time you lived on love? 
<laughs> Hallelujah. The enemy, the, the enemy wants us to try to live on stuff. But when's the last time you lived on love? Hallelujah. Some of you young folk know what I'm talking about. You know, when you see her and you say, you know, uh, and this is how it used to be when I first met my, when I first met my wife, she was, she was just such a little skinny, little cute little thing. And I, I remember there were times when we weren't together. This is back in 89. Now y'all, I, I would write little stuff on my hands. Like I write a little heart. Put, you know, Earl and TC in there. <laughs> and then every now and then I sit back and reminisce. I just living on love, you know. I just living on love. Just living on love. It, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I, I, I couldn't smell nothing wrong. Couldn't see nothing wrong. It's just, just living on love. And I, I say stuff like Earl and TC sitting in a tree. <laughs> K-I-S-S. First came, then came, then came to. <laughs> you lived on love also, huh? <laughs> she said, I'm just living on love. <laughs> just living on love. Everybody try just living on love. Yeah, then you get married and you say, oh, Lord, we. <laughs> All of a sudden, Tina turned to show up. What? <laughs> I'll catch it going on. I'll catch it light it out this way, out this way. I have lived on love. I have told you these things that my joy and delight may be in you, and that your joy and gladness may be full of measure and complete and overflowing. This is my commandment. Now watch him. This is my commandment. That you got a mighty the standard. He said, This is just a standard. And we have let the enemy break down the standard and wondered why he's wreaking havoc. In our homes, we don't love. We stay together, but we don't love. In ministry, we don't love. We go to church together, but we don't. And so the enemy says, I can't be flooded out. Because it is perfect love that casts out fear that the devil brings. I have told you that this is my commandment, that you love one another. Watch this. And I Listen, listen, not the way the world taught you to love. No, 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 no. I don't even care about what your mom and daddy taught you. I want you to love as I have loved you. I'm the standard. Love as I have loved you. Hallelujah. Would you just lift your hands up and tell God, thank you for loving you. Thank you for loving me. For every sacrifice, for every selfless act. For every service you provided to me thank you for how you love me teach me to serve the way you served me teach me the sacrifice the way you sacrificed for me teach me to be selfless the way you've been selfless for me this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you next verse No one, verse 13, has greater love. No one has shown stronger affection than to lay down, give up his own life for his friends. You are my friends if you just live the way I'm asking you to live. I do not call you servants, slaves any longer, for the servant does not know what his master is doing or working out. But I have called you my friends because I have known, made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. I have revealed to you everything that I have learned from him. You have not chosen me. I have chosen you and I have appointed you. I have planted you that you might go and bear fruit and keep on bearing and that your fruit may be lasting 
and that it may remain, may it may abide, so that for whatever you ask the Father in my name, as representing all, or as presenting all that I am, my daddy may give it to you. Would you look over at somebody and tell them love is a powerful thing? We'll talk about it more this month. But I can tell you this. There is no accident that the enemy spends all this time trying to make you selfish and hateful. Because he knows God's standard is love. He knows that if he's going to be put to flight, God's going to have to saturate and fill the hard places in your heart with love. Third part of the standard. I'm preaching better than you're listening, but that's okay. Third part of the standard is not just how we live, not just how we love, but that we live in love to leave a godly legacy. You know, we define a godly legacy as to be remembered for or what you will be remembered for or to be remembered for what you did for God. But look, watch this. If, if ever there was one thing that frustrates me as I look at not just the generation that is in power or leading today, but the generation that is coming after us, the thing that frustrates me more than anything is that everyone seems to be living for the moment and no one's living for a legacy. No one cares how they will be remembered. Everyone only cares that they get to satisfy their flesh today. Not just in the world, but also in the church. And as I get older and walk with God, and we'll talk about it in the last uh, sermon in this series, but, but one of the things that I'm more and more aware of as I get older is, I just really am concerned with how I'll be remembered. I, I, I used to live in such a way that it didn't matter. But now it really matters that my life counts. It really matters that the breath I'm breathing and the time I'm taking up on the planet counts for the glory of God. Counts for the kingdom of God. And you may not be there yet, but I'm going to tell you that nothing is more frustrating